Good evening. Welcome to the public reading for Wall Literary Journal 2016. I'm Gina Victoria Schaefer, a professor of English here at Saddleback, who serves as faculty advisor for the journal. My co-host this evening is Karen Renee Bailey, the editor-in-chief of Wall 2016 and recipient of an, out, of an award for outstanding creative writing from the Liberal Arts Division of Saddleback. I'd like to acknowledge all the people who have worked behind the scenes and offered their financial and physical support for this event, especially Kevin O'Connor, Dean of the Liberal Arts Division, Dr. Todd Burnett, President of Saddleback College, Chancellor Deborah Fitzsimmons, and the South Orange County Community College District Board of Trustees. Uh, we have with us here this evening one of the trustees, Marsha Milchiker. Could you please stand? We also have some professors of English from the English department. Could you please stand? Um, Professor Suki Fisher. <laughs> Professor Jennifer Hedgecock. <laughs> Professor Shelley Ochi. There are some other supporters who are listed on the back of your program under acknowledgments. I'd especially like to acknowledge Professor of Speech Larry Radden, whose students will be doing oral interpretations of some of the stories this evening. Actually, we're very fortunate to have Larry presenting one of the interpretations as well. Thank you to all of you who have helped make this evening possible and contributed to the continued development of WALL. Every spring, students in English 160 take on the monumental tasks of producing wall. That includes creating a distinctive visual design and layout for the journal, as well as reviewing and selecting student submissions of literature and arts. Once the pieces are chosen, the editorial staff gets involved in the tedious and precise task of editing and proofreading. And believe me, editing can be very tedious. But it's important to strive for perfection, especially since Wall has established a national presence. Since 2012, the journal has won a first place award in a national competition among college literary magazines sponsored by the American Scholastic Press Association. Individual students whose work appeared in last year's Wall were singled out last month for recognition by another national organization, the Community College Humanities Association. Jilly Pretzel received a third place award for her personal narrative, Chicken. Jilly, who served as personal narrative editor for Wall 2015, is now in the M MFA program at Chapman University and a staff member of their own literary journal, Calliope. Calliope. Yeah. Calliope. <laughs> Annabelle, Anna, Annabelle? Annabelle Santos earned a second place award for the CCHA for his watercolor painting titled El Nahual, which depicts a mystical half-human, half-animal creature of Mesoamerican folk legends. Anna Ball served as graphic designer and layout editor for Wall 2014. He has won several awards for news page layout and illustrations for the Lariat, our campus newspaper. Anna Ball, please come up to accept your award. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like Annabelle was unable to make it, uh, but congratulations anyway. Um, turning to this year's wall, you'll notice that the cover stares you straight in the face, daring you to take the plunge inside its pages. Hold your breath as we go underwater, at least figuratively, to encounter works that illuminate disillusionment, loss, and despair, the struggle for acceptance and love, the search for identity, and a yearning for peaceful retreat from the entanglements of modern life. For the written works to be read this evening, poems will be presented in their entirety, while excerpts of the short stories and personal narratives will be featured. Please note that the page number for each work is listed in the program, so please feel free to follow along in your books. The artwork will be projected on the screen. First up will be Kelly Person, presenting her illustration for the poem Mad. Uh, 
Hi, good evening. I'm Kelly Person. I'm a graphic design student here at Saddleback since 2013. Um, this work was inspired beyond the poem itself was a photo of Amy Winehouse. Actually, that's her. And I felt that her personal torment and psychological despair adequately matched the mad poem that was written. And um, yes, that's, that's really all the inspiration was. And I would like to thank The Wall for uh, showcasing my work in your magazine. Thank you. Our next uh, presentation is the short story Monsters by Christopher Schoenefeldt. And as you'll learn, Christopher is a staff member of WALL 2016. Hello. I'm Christopher Schoenfeldt, and I was one of the two fiction editors for this edition of Wall. Um, so this story was, as I think many stories are, inspired by a random daydream I had. I was uh, writing randomly in a public library, and I had a daydream of um, the sunlight suddenly becoming not the way um, so we're accustomed to sunlight, but kind of magenta and neon colored, and a creature walking down the stairs. And so I wrote a story based on that image, and after I wrote it, I realized that it was an apt metaphor for experiences that we have that kind of negate the um, um, the interpretations we have of the world and kind of necessitate the need for new stories about the world. Um, so here is an excerpt from my story, Monsters. Still wearing nothing but his socks and flannel pajama pants, Dave dashed out of the apartment, slamming the door behind him. Outside, the ordinary sounds of morning in the suburbs were gone. Traffic and chatter had been replaced by howls, roars, and manic laughter. The obscene colors of everything exclaimed themselves like lunatic shouts. Viney vi veiny vines were climbing the walls of the buildings. In every direction, he saw what must have been his neighbors, scampering, crawling, on four legs, six legs, or none. Their features flattened and stretched to fit on the skulls of bounding, heavy rhinoceros creatures and soaring, winged hammerhead sharks. He looked up and saw a horned gargoyle crouched on the roof of his building. A smaller reptilian monster was clutched in its fanged jaws, twitching and dying, its eyes growing blank with horror and resignation. He looked away before either of the faces could begin to grow too familiar. With dread blooming inside him, he sprinted towards Sadie's apartment, tearing blisters in his feet and holes in his socks. It didn't take long to find her. Before he recognized her, his eyes had jumped to the worst of the monsters filling the square. She was the one the most awful to see for looking the most human. Oh God, he said. Babo Pieta, Pieta, wailed the sky. She was shuffling on the floor of her apartment in shreds of her summer dress, her black tail ending in a teardrop-shaped stinger flexed and whipped through the air with horrible strength as she moved. Long cracked glass, quivering dragonfly wings shot out from beneath her shoulder blades, and huge multifaceted green orbs had replaced her big brown eyes. Odd mucus mu oozed from her mandibles, a glassy bubble-strewn fluid that looked like Purell. Sadie, he shouted. With a violent twitch, her head snapped back in his direction. There was no recognition in her insect eyes. She shrieked, a noise that was halfway between the call of an eagle and the gasp of mock outrage she made when he teased her about something and lunged at him, her wings whirring to life and her sharp teeth bared. He felt the awful familiarity of her hand on the side of his face before he brought the laughing Buddha down over her head and she crumpled onto the asphalt. He had not felt like going back to his apartment to face his armed and serpentine roommates. Instead, he had lifted the unconscious Sadie bug into a shopping cart and pushed her into one of the new model homes on the other side of town. She had always been bigger and taller than him, something that had been uncomfortable for them, for him, anyway. And it took some effort. The orange orchard off of his normal jogging route was now a forest of giant flowers. 
Lavishly petaled orchids, the height of streetlights, were bent with heavy fruits. Huge strawberries with thorny vermilion skins and wet green meat. Not knowing what else to do, he went down to the rows with, the, with his shopping cart, picking the biggest, least stopped and spiked fruits. Back at the model home, he neatly sliced and sugared a bunch of them into a bowl as a dinner for Sadie Bug, who was tied to the chandelier in the dining room with a thick cord made from two intertwined jump ropes he had found abandoned in the neighborhood playground. She hovered around the room, her wings humming, studying him in her new home with vacant glances. I hope you like it, he said quietly. He placed the bowl in front of her and lit a candle in the middle of the table. She squatted on the table over the bowl, questioning him with her sliced jade eyes and inquisitive cocks of her head. She forked a slice into her mouth with her mandibles. After a moment of chewing, she spat it out, clicking in disapproval. He sighed. Maybe she was a carnivore. Would he have to go out and hunt other monsters to feed her? With what? Jeff was pretty skinny. Maybe he could overpower him and take his machete. He laughed without smiling. <laughs> huh. Well, I guess I, have, I guess I have to guess what you want because you can't tell me. Something's never... The lash of her tail across his face happened before his mind registered it. The sharp pain of her stinger's flies did not paid, did not fade, and he knew the wound was poisonous. Thank you. Next, we have Conundrum's Quake by Kelly Wapst. All right, let's see, did I get this right? It's been a few years since I've been on the speech team. Larry, am I good? Am I good? Okay, great. Hi, everyone, my name is Kelly. Um, this is quite a shock, but I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm currently at Cal State Fullerton as an English major, but I feel like Saddleback College really helped set the stage for everything as far as, you know, being an English major and every single person in this room as far as, you know, I mean, Larry and, you know, other professors, English professors have really just, I'm so grateful to be here. Um, anyways, so <laughs> this poem I wrote quite a few years ago, and there's a point in our lives where I feel like we are all at you know, this point where we feel like, can we ever look back at a time where things are happy? Like sometimes we're in this kind of dark place, but we need to figure out how we can get our ways ourselves out of it, per se. So I think that through this poem, I was exploring, you know, I'm at such a dark place, but it's time to kind of pick myself up by my bootstraps and, you know, just get to a better state. Anyway, so this is Conundrum's Quake. <laughs> How did this all start? These scars take every beat of my heart and turn them into chains locked up in the castle of forgotten arts. The danger of separate terrors being built up for the pleasure. I'm no stranger to written letters of my sin paying off the paper. My eyes began to dilate to my fear. This evil is reading me like a book. My tears won't stop falling. I've got a lot to lose falling roses, my pricked fingers from the spinning wheel of lies. I no longer can deny my involvement with dark skies. Pain's poison will not let me go. It's got me under bars, yelling and shouting. Freedom is my addiction, so let me see what there is to be. When can I leave these bars clean? Demons try to choke and swarm into my complexion. The moves that I make in such a small space define my escape. When does running and hiding bleed together to become the same? Thank you. Our next uh, presentation is a short story titled Empty Space by Morgan Heaslett. Is Morgan here? Um, Morgan is a computer science major who enjoys writing things other than code when he finds the spare time. He is a fairly new writer who has never been published until now. He loves reading, watching, and writing science fiction. Uh, presenting an excerpt from Morgan's short story is Matthew Shermer. <clears throat> 
With a grunt, he yanked hard on the aluminum door, blocking his path. As the sunlight hit his face, he instinctively put his hand up to cover his eyes. He felt a bit stupid when his gloved hand met a helmet with a clunk. He would have felt lucky no one was around to see the clumsy gesture, if luck had anything to do with it. He never had to worry about looking stupid anymore. That was a small relief. He took a step forward, his foot leaving the certainty of smooth metal and crunching down on brittle stone. He had made the journey many, many, time, he had made the journey many times before, and he knew which hills to scale and which to cut around. On these walks, his mind often drifted back to her. He had been entirely hers, and she had been his, and until one day, she wasn't. He wasn't even sure there was a reason. He only wished she'd use the I just need space line. He would have found it very ironic right now. With a self-indulgent chuckle and a poke of his wrist pad, he started up his favorite playlist and kept trudging forward. He'd always been obsessed with the idea that he'd never heard his perfect song. The perfect song. An exact combination of notes and lyrics, an impossible match, specifically fit for his ears alone. There were many songs he loved over the years, but he knew it was unlikely that any one of, any one of them was the perfect one. Wouldn't he know? <laughs> Wouldn't he immediately give up his search for new music and listen to it on repeat for eternity? Maybe he wouldn't. A terrifying thought. Maybe he'd heard it before, just for a brief second as, as he flipped through radio stations and just passed by unnoticed, lost forever. Or maybe his perfect song couldn't exist in the first place. It was entirely possible that the artist who would have been responsible for it died as an infant or in a freak car accident on the way over the holidays or just decided to be a physics teacher instead of a musician because someone told him he would never make it big. It would be easy for one to give up hope. The odds just didn't favor it. Maybe he would have given up, if not for her. She would always introduce him to new music. They shared similar tastes, but she always had a way of finding sounds he'd never heard before. She'd given him hope for the perfect song. And at the time, it felt perfectly reasonable that, to think that maybe one day she would find him the song he was looking for. Then she left. The last hill of the journey was the steepest. He began a deliberate march upward, his boots carving precarious footholds in the sharp gravel that sank and shifted, but never completely collapsed. By the time he neared the top of the ridge, he was breathing with some urgency. He weighed much less than at home, but even with the bulky suit, but he'd gotten out of shape in the months he'd been waiting. I'll get a gym pass when I get back, he said. He wondered if it was crazy to be speaking aloud. Pretty sure it'd be crazy if I cared. It was strange how hard it had become to remember what normal was when there was no one around to remind him. As he finally crested the ridge, the destination of his afternoon walk waited patiently below. The sunlight reflected sharply off the car-sized object, turning the metal cylinder into a flaring fireball that burned his eyes to behold. He couldn't help but be mildly amused at the foreshadowing. The walk down the hill, which was more like a slide, was much faster than the ascent. He shortened his steps as he drew closer to the device, coming to a stop an arm's length away. He knelt down and began the inspection. It had become a daily routine, but today was different. Today, he wouldn't need to muster the energy to climb back up over that hill. Another small relief. <clears throat> Mission Control, we seem to have a problem. The use of the word we felt foreign on his tongue an obsolete sound belonging to a past life. <clears throat> Please clarify, he replied, pretending to be on the receiving end of a two-way conversation. Mission control, the device looks like it's about to explode. Right on schedule. That was the purpose of a bomb, after all, especially a nuclear bomb, man's greatest invention in the art of death. This one was specifically designed to crack open the asteroid he was standing on, a hunk of rock so large it would have been welcomed as a smaller moon, if it wasn't so intent on hitting Earth. This was a nuclear bomb, but not a nuclear weapon. The first bomb in history designed to save lives instead of end them. Well, with a few exceptions. There was always an exception, and he was it.
Next, we have the oil painting of despair. Um, Nicole isn't here today, so I'm going to be reading her bio. Nicole Karash is a Saddleback sophomore. She is currently pursuing writing and hopes to teach English ab abroad. Nicole likes to make art of others' enjoyment as well as her own and plans on continuing to sell commission pieces in the future. Yeah, as you can see, this painting is just a very, very intense portrait of despair, as it says. And I think the members of our art committee selected it for just the intensity of the mood it creates. And so this piece uh, was placed, as you'll see in the book, next to the story that's going to be read next, which is Routine uh, by Dylan Churchill. Uh, Dylan Churchill here. Um, I am not a creative writing major or English major, but uh, I've always used creative writing as a way to uh, express myself and let out uh, some emotions. Since I wasn't doing it enough, I took a creative writing class at Saddleback um, this last semester, and this story started out as an assignment um, to, to write a short story. So I actually cannot take credit for the story. It's an existence through a song format. Um, my favorite artist, Stephen Wilson, uh, wrote a song about a woman who's lost her family. Um, and there's a very graphic video that goes along with it. Um, and basically, I drew inspiration for that. So the words are original. The story is not. Um, but I'll go ahead and read an excerpt. Her next task included filling the children's lunch pails and pre presenting them on the dresser next to the door. She sat them down, twitched anxiously, and twisted her son's lunch pail so that it faced just right. She turned and walked down the hall. As she passed her husband's coat hanger, dressed and appearing almost animate, she pulled a sleeve desperately to her nose. Filling her nostrils with a scent long faded and no longer recognizable. Her imagination jumped in anticipation, attempting to recreate the smell of her husband she could not remember. At the shock of this, chills consumed her. A single tear fell. She brushed it off. She looked at the clock, 9.01 AM. By this time, her children and husband would have been walking out the door. Her husband always drove the boys to school and dropped them off on his way to work. This was her cue. She climbed up the windy wooden staircase to tidy up the boys' room as always. Making their beds felt silly, but she did it anyways. Each fold, each crease, taking her deeper into a trance that kept her half in this world and half out. When she finished, she lay on the, gr on the floor, not a single thought penetrating her mind. She awoke several hours later to find herself on the floor of her children's bedroom. This was normal. She acted as an infant who had just barely found the will to confront gravity, wrestling with the floor to lift herself up. She peered outside the window, too numb to notice the peach and vanilla color of the clouds which stretched across a setting sky. She feared only the dark, and as long as the dark had not come to bruise the sky, she was okay. In a daze, she floated down the stairs and into the kitchen. She stared at the refrigerator, her eyes lingering on school paintings still hung on magnets. One of them fell. It was one of Percy's, his little handprint made into a turkey for Thanksgiving. She snatched it before it could hit the ground and attached it back in its exact place. For a moment, she remembered his little blonde head running into the house, painting clenched in hand. Chills crept down her spine once again. After preparing dinner, she sat down at an empty table, two big plates, two small plates. This was the way. She ate only one or two bites and then stopped. She didn't want to be the only one eating. She noticed darkness approaching. Darkness fell, and after tucking the boys into bed, she hurried down the stairs. At the bottom, she kicked over the stainless steel scrub bucket, which hid in the shadow of the night. Water splashed about the floor. She stared blankly, but inside, emotions began churning. The thought of anything out of the ordinary, especially in the dark, caused her to remember. Her blood turned into molten lava, reaching places in her body that had remained cold and untouched for several weeks. She ran into the kitchen and sat down on a chair. She fidgeted, moving from the middle of the edge of the chair, from the middle of the chair to the edge. She lifted her fist up to her chin and then back down again. Out of the corner of her eye, her son's automatic toy rolled to the legs of the chair, but she looked down to see nothing beside her. Becoming aware of her state of mind, she struggled to force down the swelling sensation just underneath her chest. She anxiously ran into the, ran in, ran to the kitchen sink and began scrubbing dishes. A drop of blood fell from her hands and into the soapy water. The entire sink appeared to be filled with blood. She twitched. What is happening to me? She cried. 
She rushed back into the living room, picked up the metal scrub laying on the ground, and threw it in anger. The scrub struck one of the still full lunch pails from earlier and caused it to fall to the floor. Next to the lunch pail, she noticed a newspaper with the headline, Father and Two Sons Die in School Shooting. It had been almost a month since she had faced the reality of what had happened to her family. For a moment, she remembered arriving at the schoolyard that day, wrestling through the arms of a pale-faced policeman to reach the place where her family lay bloody and on the ground. She remembered the reflection of the red and blue lights in the windows of the classrooms and several strangers with faces appearing to have cried for an eternity. She snapped back when she noticed the swelling within her chest like a tidal wave. She ran outside the front door and into the night. A feeling of intense vibrating energy electrified her senses and combined with the rising emotion that had moved up and into her throat. She let out a, she let out a scream. When she awoke the next morning, every cell of her body felt alive. Her breaths were full and satisfying. She looked around her room. It was all fresh and new. She opened her window and stuck her nose into the coolness of the breeze. She noticed the humming of the bees in the lavender sway. Making her way carefully downstairs, she felt the coolness of the wood against her warm flesh and smiled at the glowing wooden handrail. She then opened up a cabinet, noticing that the handle was a metal knob in the shape of a heart with intricate designs in the center. This cabinet was where she had hidden dozens of letters from friends and family in a box. She sat at the windowsill, gazing out into the wonder of the rising sun, and opened the first letter. Thank you. Next, we have the illustration of a poem called Wasted, which is by Arnold Augustine. So since Arnold isn't here, I'm going to read his bio. Arnold Augustine is a graphic design student who enjoys being creative and utilizing all forms of media. Additional pieces can be viewed on his website at augustinedesign.com. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on this piece. Um, it's done by a process called scratchboard illustration, which is very, very painstaking. And um, as it happens, as um, the part of the image, you can see a woman underwater with bubbles. And it was just kind of serendipitous that that ended up being our cover image. And we have um, theme of being underwater and disillusionment, and it just fit in really beautifully. So we're very grateful for all the artists who are contributing to Wall. Our next piece is by Karen Renee Bailey, our very talented editor-in-chief. It's a poem titled, You Can Be Anything. So I like to think of writing as simply an advanced way of thinking. Advanced is defined in Merriam-Webster Dictionary as being far on in time or course, beyond others in progress, greatly developed beyond an initial stage, etc. Writing forces the fluttering thoughts to slow to a crawl and in the process often begs a deeper, more profound analysis of something we may momentarily feel or perhaps genuinely believe. When I wrote this poem, I was probably thinking something along the lines of being a grown up is really hard or I hate bills <laughs> or the oh so cliche, what the hell am I doing with my life? I honestly don't remember where I was or what I was doing. This poem, like most of mine, was undeliberate. I do remember, though, pulling out my phone, a bit more feisty than I usually do, and typing into a new note the lines that read almost identical to what is printed now in this literary journal. For me, my truest art is the kind that pours out like the slurred words of an angry drunk, but in the process forces some intimate consideration. The thoughts about adulthood being shittier than previously expected matured into reminiscence of childhood, of how the five-year-old Karen viewed the world, of the things she was led to believe that made the shock of being a grown-up so cruel in the first place. As a disclaimer, short pieces can be limited to just one frame of mind or mood. I'm often thrilled to be the most free I ever have been, and I don't take for granted my tendency to strike gold in terms of arbitrary bouts of luck. In other words, I don't always hate being a grown-up, but when I do, I write poems about it. <laughs> you can be anything, but they didn't breathe the chill of deceit down your fine spine when they, other when they uttered those sweet lines, those that made the heart believe in time that does not tick, in reality that exists a mere replica of the destiny you imagined would be. 
dreamt of so fervently with the blind determination of a moth drawn to light. Light so bright, we forgot to mention the sting. Only sing hymns in La La Land where we grow up as grand as we all expected. As though what we intended is precisely what we catapult into. Caterpillar breaking through carefully crafted cocoon at the ripe age of adulthood. If only the transition were so understood. But like romantic love, so much more persists than the momentary bliss we never had trouble recognizing. And so those little faces grow up to furrowed brows, calculating the hows of living ill-equipped for the sinking ship that is mortality. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I really appreciate all the wisdom, intuition, and guidance you brought to this beautiful edition of Wall. So we're very fortunate to have your guidance and vision. Our next piece is a poem called I Am Not Discriminated Against by I Am Nepo Messino. And um, Isabel uh, could not be here this evening. She asked me to read a statement on her behalf about the poem. Uh, she's a student here at Saddleback, majoring in biology, and is planning to attend UCLA to pursue a career in medicine. Writing poetry has never been a hobby for her, but when given the opportunity in Professor Schaefer's class, she took it. It took a couple of days to find inspiration for a poem, and finally she found it when she overheard a conversation between two people. They were talking about the recent killings of African Americans and how the Black Lives Matter movement didn't make sense. She was overwhelmed with emotion towards the ignorance these people had and wrote the poem right then and there. She wants this poem to educate people who do not understand that racism still exists today. She wants for them not to take for granted the daily blessings they receive of not being discriminated against and to encourage them not to discriminate against others. She wants to thank her family and friends for supporting her always and for teaching her how to treat others with respect and love. Uh, Isabel's poem will be presented by Larry Radden. I've not been careful of the clothes that I wear. I've not been careful of the words that I speak. I've not been careful of the streets that I can freely walk. And that is because I'm not discriminated against. I've not seen people walk the other way. I've not seen people grip their purses tighter. I've not seen people lock their doors as I pass by. And that is because I have not been discriminated against. I've not come home with tears straining my face from harsh words. I've not come home with blood and bruises on my body. I've not come home in handcuffs and chains around my hands. But that is because I've not been discriminated against. But why do humans discriminate against each other? Is it because we've done something wrong? No. It's because of little differences in the color of our skin. Next is Aerial View, a short story by Zia Kanani. Zia Kanani was not able to attend this evening, so I'll read a statement on his behalf. Zia Kanani is a first year medical student at the Medical College of Wisconsin. His idea for his short story, Aerial View, came from his time spent living in the San Francisco Sunset District after graduating college. He would like to thank Professor Stevenson for showing his students how to make fiction writing a fun and meaningful experience. Zia's story will be read by Vivian Vilches. <laughs> 
Saima watched as the world slowly shrank below him. Gargantuan trees dwindled to tiny shrubs, which seemed to congregate around glistening puddles of water. The altitude reduced people to moving black pellets as Saima soared higher. Roars of harsh sea winds intensified, drowning out any noises that could have still been heard from the city hundreds of feet below. A giant flat grid of white and gray segments stretching for miles surrounded the now minuscule green rectangle below. The checkered lattice of streets and avenues eventually gave way to a motionless ocean that hugged the urban peninsula. Saima was used to this view. Climbing to this height, a level no one else could reach, was indeed liberating. But it took him away from what he enjoyed most, people. He dove back down towards the earth below, a flash of green light trailing his swift movements. Statesman Park returned to full view, its hiking trails twisting like snakes through dense clumps of green foliage. The moving black specks enlarged as Saima lowered his flight further, their moving appendages becoming visible as they crawled about the expansive terrain. One group seemed to be passing a tiny black ball back and forth in a field. Another cluster rested on their backs in the meadow. On a windy turn of a dirt trail, a family took notice of Saima, their tiny arms waving towards the sky. Excited, Saima raced towards the hikers, their bodies turning life-sized as he drifted to their level. Now, flying just a few feet above the dusty clay road, he drew near and danced around a jubilant, three-foot, button-nosed girl. Her blonde pigtails bounced as she jumped up and down, her wide eyes following Saima's every move. Her hands reached up at him. Her smiling father swooped down and picked her up, holding her above his head as she tried to grab Saima with her pinky, stubby arms. Saima jolted up a few feet to avoid the child's grasp and took back to the sky. Saima loved to be around people, but he felt uneasy whenever they tried to grab him. Time to move on. After migrating a few miles west, he encountered a small secluded beach hidden behind a thicket of cypress trees. From a hundred feet below, a tiny rim of white foam ricocheted back and forth against the rough sand, eventually disappearing back into the ocean. A tiny red umbrella stood out amidst the massive strip of beige. Intrigued, Saima lowered himself quietly towards the sandy coast, inching closer to the umbrella. Two peachy figures of very different proportions lay underneath it. Saima drew closer. The first figure was a sea lion of a man lying on a towel with only a speedo and a bed of chest hair covering his tan, pruny skin. His belly stacked so high, its shadow nearly engulfed the woman lying beside him. Saima carefully flew around to get a better look. She had a petite figure, excluding the areas of her body injected with silicone. A tight bikini decorated her smooth body, which glistened in the sun as a result of excessive sunblock application. They both appeared to be napping. Saima must have snuck too close to her massive partner because he suddenly jerked his head left and right. What the hell, he murmured, lifting his sunglasses. He spotted Saima staring right at him. Hey, hey you, get out of here, asshole. <laughs> his girlfriend shrieked, burying her head into his flabby torso as he tried to get up. Startled, Saima tried to escape hitting the umbrella. The impact knocked him down to the sand with a violent hiss. He rose up again, blowing sand in every direction. The man swooped his 60 ounce soda cup and chucked it at Saima. A cool splash of brown bubbly liquid soaked Saima's entire body. He couldn't see straight. He couldn't fly straight. The world began to dance around him as he hurtled across the beach 
an orange light trailing his jerky movements. Sparks flew in his periphery. Things were moving too fast to process. Tree, grass, sky, sand, sky, sky, tree, dirt, grass, sky, water, people, tree, tree. He collided with the trunk of a thick cypress tree, creating an explosion of plastic shards that rained down onto the asphalt road. Several hours later, a 13-year-old boy raced toward the trunk of the dented cypress tree, clutching a controller in one hand and his backpack in the other. His callous-ridden hands lifted the body frame of his severely damaged RC drone. Sniffling, he grabbed the remains of his precious Sima X5C quadcopter and bolted home. Our next presenter is Jim Langford to tell us about his photograph, Eureka. Thanks, I'm Jim Langford, and photography has been my passion for as long as I can remember. I remember uh, standing in a darkened hallway in LA and uh, looking at the red glow from underneath the bathroom as my dad was on the other side humming away and he was developing our photos from the day before. It was crazy. Since that day, I've been armed deep in chemicals and uh, photography. Uh, I started uh, working in photography not too long ago here at Saddleback, and uh, I'm working in the photo department now, so dreams do come true. Eureka was not just about the moment that we found this spot, but it's the valley that it lives in and the dune that it is. It's uh, Eureka Dunes in Death Valley. It's on the northern, northwest side of it. Some say it's the tallest sand dune in uh, the United States. If you haven't been there, it's a pretty magical place. So it has um, five beetle colonies that live there that are only in that one area and three endangered plant species. And if you could look really close, you could see one of the plant species in the lower left-hand side there. Um, and it was a magical moment. So that's about it. I want to thank Gina and her staff for allowing me to be in the uh, wall again. I've been here three years in a row. So that's really good. And thank you, guys. Thank you, Jim. Keep up the good work. So next we have Assistance for the Drowning, which is a personal narrative by Lauren Weirer. Since Lauren, who served as a member of the Fiction Committee and a copy editor for Wall 2016, is currently studying English at UC Berkeley, uh, she couldn't be here tonight, but I will read a short bio on her behalf. Lauren has had an affinity for words since she was in second grade and wrote a story, admittedly rather unoriginal, about a dog and his adventures. She hopes to pursue a career where she can continue to utilize her love for literature. Her favorite activities include losing herself in a story, viewing and capturing the world through the lens of a camera, and finding transcendence in music. Lauren's personal narrative will be presented by Natalie Daly. I used to rescue helpless drowning insects swooping in with a frantically pulled Kisby ringley for a life raft twig, saving them from the colossal chlorinated expanse of our backyard pool. I would circle around and around on high alert for any frenzied disturbances in our otherwise still water. The most inconsequential of ants was not immune to my empathy. After their tired insect bodies had found their way onto whatever variant of life-saving debris I had hurriedly constructed, I'd place them in a bush or on the cement by the pool. Sometimes I would watch their wet bodies, dark and glistening against the bright sun-soaked cement as they sluggishly dragged their heavy, microscopic wings. I'd continue watching as they slowly dried. This wasn't a particularly regular occurrence. It was just something I did every now and then when I was around 12 years old. I suppose I wanted to feel like I was making a difference. Was it for the sake of the poor insects with their chaotic, kicking, spindle legs and watered muddle wings? Yes, I definitely felt for them. But now 
I wonder if there was something within myself that found a sense of fulfillment in this seemingly trivial activity that went beyond the self-satisfaction of doing a good deed. Maybe I liked knowing that I had changed a life. Even if it was just an insect, I had changed the course of history, even if it was in an imperceptible way. I hadn't conducted any type of pool surveillance in years, unfortunately for all the insects that strayed into the watery abyss and found themselves in a rather grim situation. But on a rare rainy day sometime last year, or perhaps the year before, I was working on the computer when I happened to glance up and see my mom through the open back door, interacting in a curious way with one of our outdoor potted plants. I went back to my work, but out of the corner of my eye, I kept seeing her as she strode back and forth between the pool and our potted plant. I was mystified by her manic pacing, but she soon volunteered the reason behind it. Lauren, come help me! What? was my reply. Lauren, come out here and help me! She sounded nearly frantic. What are you doing? I yelled back at her through the open door. She explained that there were about 50 worms drowning in the little pools of water that had collected in the dips of our concrete and in the pool itself. I went outside and sure enough, there were a bunch of earthworms squirming desperately in the water while other dead, bloated ones lay sunken at the bottom of our pool. I looked at my mom in simultaneous awe and exasperated incredulity. She continued with her mission to rescue all of them as I stood there and wondered why my middle-aged mother cared about the fates of these wriggling earthworms. I mean, a 12-year-old going through the trouble is one thing, but this was quite another. She had never shown such compassion towards drowning bugs before. I wondered what had acted as a catalyst for her sudden sense of obligation. It's still a mystery to me, Especially when I recall all those times, despite my incessant protestations, that she carelessly flung the snails that had cheerfully been chomping on our front yard vegetation in the street to be run over by an oblivious neighbor driving past. My best conjecture is that she was disturbed by the sheer amount of water-induced casualties these worms were experiencing. The dozens upon dozens of tormented, conspicuous bodies wriggling helplessly it was quite the massacre. I could see that my mother was truly overcome by the situation. You do it, she said, still in a state of distress, carrying one that flopped about on a leaf. Her face was crumpled in aversion. You used to play with worms. I didn't ever play with them, I said. I held them in my hands a few times when I was about 12. Can you please do it, she persisted, sounding overwhelmed. I don't have time. I still have to go get ready, and there's so much I still need to do. I relented, partly for my mom's sake and partly due to the guilt that had slowly accumulated as I stood staring at the dead worms lying ominously at the bottom of the pool. After all, there once was a time in my life when I had spent up to an hour a day fishing, fishing insects that made fruitless tiny circles around and around in our pool. This wasn't so different, though. Instead of swimming in circles, the worms were only able to flop to and fro. They needed help. Desperately. So I helped them, sighing and asking myself what in the hell I was doing the entire time. I suppose I did feel bad for those worms, but I didn't feel it with the same intensity I had felt all those years ago. Had I grown up? Gained a sense of perspective through experience? Or had I lost something? Something that, even if I tried, I could never get back. Our next piece is an excerpt for a short story for the ones we leave behind by Megan Brown Allard, who served as the personal narrative editor of Wall 2016. She's now studying English at the University of Oregon and couldn't attend tonight, so I'll read her statement about this piece. I've always been struck by the relationships between women. 
whether they are between mothers and daughters or friends or sisters, there is an unspoken bond between women that is difficult to explain. We simply understand each other. At my grandfather's funeral, I watched as my mother and her sisters reconciled their differences and were bonded in their grief. All three of them sat on my mother's hotel bed and looked at old photos. And I watched as these women, who could not be more different, put aside their dissimilarities in favor of consoling each other and recalling the happier moments depicted in the photographs. My mother has always encouraged me to write and always emphasized the importance of reading. For the ones we leave behind was the first finished story I ever let my mother read. I didn't realize it until the last draft or so, but this story has always belonged to her. The excerpt from Megan's short story will be presented by Kelsey Carroll and McKenna Gilbert. Annette stood in the foyer, greeting guests for as long as she could. There was only so much I'm so sorry for your loss. She could take before she excused herself and made a break away from the swarm of people offering their condolences. She snuck up the stairs of her childhood home until she found her mother's room. When they were children, Annette and her older sister Carrie had each silently claimed a specific spot in their mother's room. Carrie usually sat on the floor, in front of the bed, or in the, in the plushy red chair in the corner. While Annette always found herself curled up against her mother's side in the middle of the bed. It was Annette's favorite place in the entire house, and she would often be found wrapped up in the blankets on the bed, even when her own room was just down the hall. The night before the funeral, Annette had searched the house for remnants of her childhood, but in preparation for the reception, Carrie had spruced up their family home with bouquets of fake flowers and cheap candles. Her sister was getting an early start on preparing the house to be put up for sale and had packed up most of their childhood items in boxes in the garage. Annette stared longingly at the bed her mother used to sleep in. She wanted to hide under the covers while her mother consoled her. Annette knew that if she curled up on that bed, she would never want to leave. But the sheets had been washed. And the bed was made up with fresh, yellow-flowered sheets she'd never seen before. The comfort she was searching for could no longer be found there. She decided to sit in her mother's bathtub instead. There wasn't so much you could change about a bathtub. Annette was happy to find something that remained familiar. She liked that she could hide inside of it when she was small. Her body was too big for that now. It was very uncomfortable. The muffled symphonies and cautious movements of the guests downstairs were still audible, and they craved something to drown them out. No matter their relation, they all said the same thing. They all mm -hmm. had pleasant things to say about their mother. But, but they, they wanted, wanted them, them to, to stop reminding them that, that mother is dead. No, she's, she's just running late. I'm not sure where she is, but, but I, I know, know she'll, she'll be here soon. soon. Carrie stretched one long leg over the side of the tub. She pulled the wine bottle off the counter and the rest of her body followed gracefully as she slid down to the bottom of the tub across from her sister. As she stretched her legs out the length of the tub, Annette pulled hers closer to her chest. So, why the bathtub? Do you not understand what go away means? I used to hide in here and Mom got mad at me. Carrie took a swig from the wine bottle and extended it to me. Why did you change Mom's sheets? Because they needed to be washed. No, they don't. I'm not gonna fight with you about Mom's sheets, that's just stupid. Well, you should have left them alone. They were hers. They were sheets. But they were hers. Things needed to be washed. We, were, we needed to start putting things away, and 
boxes and someone had to do it. And you decided to start without me? I wasn't gonna wait around for you to finally show up so we could start. You took too long. I'm sorry. That wasn't entirely fair. I know you had trouble getting someone to watch Sarah. Not to mention trying to buy a ticket out here on such short notice. It wasn't just that. I had a hard time even thinking about all this. Every time I tried to book my ticket, I was reminded that even though I was going home, I wasn't going to see her. I just... I really didn't want to get on that plane and then drive out here and find out that I had completely missed her. I didn't want to be in this house when she wasn't here. It doesn't feel right without her. I know, but... Hell, hell, I didn't even recognize half the people downstairs who were trying to tell me stories about mom. I was listening to them all talk and I started to wonder if I even knew her at all. Why? Because some neighbor told you a story about how mom saved the cul-de-sac Christmas light display because she had two extra extension cords and a blow-up snowman? <laughs> you heard that one too? <laughs> yeah. And there was something about a snowstorm? <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of snow and no one wanted to drive. <laughs> but mom drove anyway. <laughs> she was quite the hero. <laughs> You're not the only one that misses her. Thank you. Next is Gifts of the Season, a personal narrative by Jordan Hall. Hello. So yes, my name is Jordan Hall. Um, I'm a second year student here at Saddleback. My major is psychology, but I hope to double major in creative writing, and I plan to transfer. Um, before I start, I would like to thank um, the wall for selecting uh, my personal narrative. Um, I'm going to share a short excerpt from it, and I'd like to tell you that it's inspired by an experience I had in high school um, while I was in the chamber choir, and we had the opportunity to go to Mission Viejo Hospital and sing um, Christmas carols uh, for the holiday season to some of the patients there. The weight of guilt finally broke me, and I began to question what I was doing there. Barging in on this private family visitation, barging into perhaps the most difficult time in this woman's life. I dreaded the thought that this amateur high school choir had no effect, no effect on her state of mind, except as an annoying episode in her day. That this was all just some pointless charade. From that look of pain, I feared that my voice could not bring this woman any peace. Then suddenly, the woman began to cry, and I began to immediately think that I had done something wrong. I glanced around at my friends, and many of them had begun to cry, not in sobs, but with gentle tears streaming down their faces. Maybe the woman thought we sounded terrible, or maybe she thought, or maybe she saw right through us but it was not as it initially seemed at all. I looked back at the woman and I was shocked to see that she was smiling. Her tears were not tears of pain, but tears of joy. My confusion quickly evaporated as I realized that at this very moment, I was part of something so much bigger than myself. I began to feel the, the tears streaming down my own face. Everyone was crying now. Never before had I felt so much emotion in one room. At the end of our song, we were all smiling again, filing out of the room saying, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, while the woman used all of her strength to nod her head and whisper, Thank you. Tears still spilling out of her eyes. While we regrouped outside, sharing tissue packets and sympathetic smiles, the nurse explained that the woman had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. This was likely her last Christmas. Now I know what real empathy tastes like. It's bitter like a tear. 
I saw that those patients lying in bed were no different than me, no different than my friends, no different than the chaperones or the doctors or the hospital staff. They just happened to be people who were sick during the holidays. Didn't anyone tell the illnesses that it was Christmas? Didn't anyone tell cancer that these people had someplace else to be? Thank you. Our final uh, presentation of the evening will focus on the work of the very talented graphic designer and layout editor for Wall, Leanne Black, who flew in all the way from Portland to be here this evening. So we're very grateful. She proved to be a very adventurous and innovative artist, photographer, and designer. So we're very fortunate. She will tell you about her piece, uh, Zen, the photograph, and she will also talk about the incredible co cover that she designed. Hi, so um, I'm actually happy to be back at Saddleback. Never thought I'd say that. But um, <laughs> this was actually taken in the Portland Japanese Garden, which I just wanted to capture how it made me feel. And it's always made me feel very relaxed and zen. So that's, that was the goal of this picture. And that is also my sister, who is on the cover. <laughs> um, so the cover was basically um, based off the word disillusionment, which I got from Karen. Um, we came up with the idea of bursting bubbles or balloons as things are not always as they seem. And um, I t drew a few sketches up of this and um, talked it over with them. And thankfully, I have a gorgeous sister um, who could be a part-time model. And um, photographing her was pretty simple. We got into the pool. Um, thank you to our neighbors, the bombs, for their wonderful yard. <laughs> um, but Lauren did not want to go in the pool. So um, we moved to the jacuzzi. And I had to photograph her in there, being very careful not to hit her with my camera equipment. But um, it took about maybe 15 minutes and a few, I felt we had a few good frames, you know, to give as an example in class. But um, these frames actually ended up being the cover. And so, yeah, that's what's wrapped around wall. My sister's face. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that concludes our public reading. Um, if you're a student at Saddleback, please submit your work for the 2017 edition of WALL. You could be here next year presenting your work. Um, so please be sure to pick up a submission form on the table in the lobby near the entrance. And also, if you'd like to join the staff of WALL, you can talk to me. There are flyers in the back. Um, if there are any students receiving extra credit for attendance this evening, I have a sign-up sheet at the table. We also have a sign in sheet to be on our contact list for uh, email messages. I want to thank everyone for being such a great audience and sharing the illuminating and emotionally engaging words and works in this year's wall. Um, and so this is, is, is always such an inspiring and lovely tribute to the literary and artistic talents of our Saddleback students. Thank you very much. Thank you.